And hello, uh, welcome. This is uh, welcome to the uh, RPM Challenge uh, Lanya Vanya workshop series session version 2.0. Um, my name is Elling. Um, I'm the uh, coordinator of the RPM and trying to find my screen here. Stop, stop share. There we go. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the stream. Um, yeah, my name is Elling. I'm a coordinator of the RPM Challenge. The RPM Challenge, if you're just stumbling onto this, is an international challenge to anybody to record music in the month of February. And it's open to everybody, any genre, any length, um, anywhere in the world, uh, any level of experience. Uh, it's free to take part. And uh, you can find out more at rpmchallenge.com. And uh, over the uh, next month, we're going to be we're uh, hosting workshops in partnership with uh, organizations uh, uh, to uh, help you uh, make stuff, basically. <laughs> um, so, uh, and today is one of those days. Uh, and joining me today is Sarah Harris from uh, Lani Vanya. Uh, how are you doing today, Sarah? I'm pretty good. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie. And you're, you're joining us from Montreal. Is that right? Yeah, I'm in Montreal too. Yeah. And I'm in Newfoundland, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, St. John. Um, and what, what, how's it, how's the weather out there? It's chilly today. No sun. Well, yeah, it's overcast. So I'm thinking snow is coming later. It's cold, bitter, bitter cold. I think, I think it gets colder here than it does in St. John's. I know. It's like nostril, nose hair, freezing uh, cold, uh, which always astounded me. I lived in Montreal for a little while, and or for it's actually a little while, seven years. And um, uh, Newfoundland, yeah, the Newfoundland cold was, it was quite different. Um, and, yeah. But one thing that I love about Montreal is that spring is really just around the corner right now <laughs> all right yeah i can't wait glad to hear that my first my first winter here yes um but yeah so my name's sarah i'm here representing lonnie vanya i'm the programming coordinator uh we're a music festival and we do a festival every june or sorry every spring it's not always june it's june this year june 8th to the 11th and um, yeah, we like do workshops and stuff throughout the year, some shows when we can. And um, yeah, we're stoked that uh, we're joined here today by Charles Harding, who is uh, an emerging sound maker living in Montreal and studying electroacoustic composition at Concordia University. Um, his focus spans various artistic disciplines, including algorithmic composition, soundscape design, creative coding, VR, AR, and also uh, interdisciplinary collaborations with uh, his collaborator artist, Emily Blair, who's a textiles artist. So yeah, that's lots of uh, specializations, Charles. Um, <laughs> and all, we all have something in common because we, we uh, 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 all know Kevin Austin. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Kevin Austin at the Electroacoustics Department. Shout out to Kevin. It's great, a great sound mentor to, uh, to lots of people. Mm -hmm. He's made a lot of sound happen. Absolutely. So, Charlie, are you uh, ready to go here now? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. How are you doing? Thanks. How are you doing, Charles? Oh, I, I'm quite well. Sarah, I got to ask you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good day. Uh, it's a Sunday. Um, I I'd, I'd forgotten. I, I guess that's how good a day it is. Like I suppose, like the days get better when you forget which day they are. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I woke up this morning. The only thing that actually made me remember that it was Sunday was that this was happening. Um, nice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so far so good. I'm also in Montreal, um, and uh, Sarah was right. It is cold. Um, <laughs> but I'm very much looking forward to the, the, the spring sun, the birds. Yes. <laughs> good. Um, shout out to everybody in the chat. Um, uh, if you, uh, throughout this, 
if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat and uh, Sarah and I will be monitoring that and we'll bring it to Charles at a good moment. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, make sure, like, feel free to post in there where you're listening from or where you're watching from. Uh, always love to hear that. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll do that. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, finding out where people are watching from like brings me extra butterflies for some reason but <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty cool um okay uh so shall i share my screen totally tuberculosis fish says i'm excited for this workshop oh. shout out to tuberculosis fish thanks tuberculosis fish um okay what am i sharing here here just give me one moment i just have to find the right screen. Ah, here it is. I, I, I just said, I love sound when my mic was muted. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's ironic. Yeah, it's a good irony. <laughs> um, oh, hold on. I did the one thing that I'm not supposed to do and that's share share the screen without sharing the presentation screen. faux pas yeah exactly i feel like i've, I've done enough school presentations that i should know <laughs> but i guess there's never enough, <clears throat> never enough okay right. here we go <clears throat> so um i'd like to begin uh by acknowledging that the place from which i'm presenting this workshop is located on unceded indigenous lands uh, the Ganyagahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Um, Chiochage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. <clears throat> so, uh, I'll start off with, uh, well, I'll second with a little about myself. Um, I, and also I've been, uh, trying my hand at, uh, design type work by, uh, attempting to copy the image branding of, of this workshop. As you can see, my drawings aren't as cute as the ones on the original cover, but I'm trying my best. It was one of my first goes at Procreate on uh, on an iPad. So, um, so yeah, uh, my name is Charlie. Uh, I currently live in uh, Montreal. I go to Concordia University, and I study electroacoustic composition. Um, I'm in my fourth year, and I'll be graduating this year uh, with a prospective path of studying music technology. Um, my my uh, from my introduction uh, that Sarah read, um, <laughs> I one could say I specialize in lots of things or I specialize in nothing, um, and, <laughs> and I just fully uh, drive into the into the great beyond, bumping into whatever comes across my path, uh, and if I like it, a, a little branch grows. And if I don't, then at least it was fun. Um, so, uh, but one of the main focuses that I'd like to study in the future is the creation of algorithmic music using uh, certain programming languages. I dabble in languages like uh, Super Collider and in um, kind of algorithmic music composition language, uh, languages such as Tidal Cycles and Max and, um, yeah, lots of different kinds of things like that. So I'd eventually like to be able to, to know how to build my own languages and to explore that world because I find having computer collaborators is a really exciting thing for coming up with ideas and thinking about music in another way. But another one of my great passions is also kind of contrasting to that, uh, that direction. Um, here, one moment which is the um, 
the love of found sound, sound that you can collect in the world, and uh, more specifically in collecting sound through field recordings and um, yeah, and just experiences in general. Uh, I find that the practice of collecting sound and searching for sound in the world uh, allows you to broaden your uh, listening skills and to adapt and achieve um, different kinds of, you know, what is called modes of listening, ways of listening to the world in more specific and um, kind of contained ways. Uh, so that, yeah, that that kind of encompasses part of my passion. Um, so I think... Yeah, I always find it a little difficult ad libbing about myself, but I think that's I think I think we've got it. I think we've got it. Um, oh yeah, here's a picture of me, uh, and yeah, it's at school. Um, and now let's talk about found sound. So um, this is a uh, <clears throat> I had a lot of fun searching for a definition of found sound because I <laughs> I don't know I. I could have I could have tried to write one myself, but I like to see what the internet has. So I I found on the um, musical instrument sales website Sweetwaters uh, this uh, definition that they wrote for found sound, which is a somewhat vague term that generally refers to sounds drawn from common objects that are not normally considered particularly musical. And I yeah this this one kind of resonated with me because. <clears throat> I love this aspect of taking something that could be considered mundane or as a utility and kind of putting a new perspective on it and listening to it as if it is a piece of music or something that is containing rhythm. Um, you know, the same way that we might look at connected objects in a room, there are a lot of doors in my room that are kind of like a brown wooden color. and you know, when I look into my room, I connect those all because they have such similarities. And you can adapt this kind of, um, you know, perceptual ability in the uh, in the world of listening, where certain sounds, when you listen in a certain way, become connected to each other and can become very musical, even though that wasn't their original, uh, or the the intention wasn't there to begin with. Um, and I I find that is just a really lovely thing about the kind of, I don't know, the experience of digging into this type of world of found sound. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, some more of my little drawings. Um, just uh, these uh, these drawings kind of represent the difference between, you know, a, a kind of pure sign tone and some of the sounds that you can find in the world that are kind of crazy and chaotic signals. Um, so I have a little mixed bag of keywords or uh, things that I like to think about when I'm looking for sounds or getting interested in sounds and collecting um, through various ways. So um, one of the things that I like to consider is, uh, you know, does this particular sound that I'm paying attention to right now have a um, a context that is pretty, you know, loud. Like, is it easy when listening to this that you can tell where it came from, where you can tell what it has to do with? Um, but then on the other end, you can intentionally look for sounds that are really ambiguous. And, you know, when you decide to start composing with those sounds, you know, like the sound of just a plane in the sky or, um, or some kind of buzzing, um, the mind has this lovely way of attaching meaning to things and connecting kind of mental image or experience to sounds that you hear. So you can play with these um, differences or this kind of duality of context and ambiguity to um, to compose and to build these pathways that the mind can go in listening to music composed from sounds from the world. Um, this kind of also leads to uh, this next point. You know, all these are, they're just kind of like, I took a moment and threw together a bunch of terms. So some of them are connected pretty uh, pretty quickly, I guess. So, um, but yeah, semantically charged sounds, sounds that have meaning uh, already attached, I find really exciting to play with. But as well, I draw uh, from this, um, you know, these couple of words in ways that you can actually compose um, 
semantically. You can put sounds that are ambiguous, ambiguous together, and through the way that they're composed together, they can form meaning eventually. You know, if you introduce a sound at the beginning of a composition, and then midway through, and then at the end, as you know, someone is listening to it, they may find themselves you know, discovering a relationship between the sounds that builds a kind of abstract meaning um, from that, uh, from you know that way that they were put together. So um, another thing that I look for in found sounds, and something I get excited about with found sounds, is their spectral richness. So. Um, a lot of synthesizer tones, which also I do love, are you know things like the pure sine tones or square waves, those kinds of things that the you know the they they kind of comfortably and harmonically fit together um, when you're using them on you know kind of these equally divided scales, uh, and you can they it's pretty easy to hear them and to tell where they're going sometimes. But um, a thing I love about collecting sounds from the world is that they're kind of, they're built in with this imperfection, these like the beauty of, you know, turbulent waves that are bouncing around the world. And so I get really inspired by that when I'm collecting sounds, you know, like the simplest thing is just packed with so much movement. You know, if you, if you record one cycle of a wave on a beach, you could explore that sound forever. Um, and, uh, and that could just be what you do. Um, yeah, once again, this, uh, referential or associative signals kind of bounces off context or ambiguity. It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, are these sounds referring to something or each other? Uh, uh, can they associate easily together the same way that like, you know, principles of design, like gestalt principles allow us to group, um, you know, objects that are like together in our vision, um, you know, our hearing allows us to do that as well. And yeah, is the sound abstract or concrete? So I guess I said a lot of these different things, just, or a lot of these things in this, the same topic, but just in different ways. Um, um, so someone, someone on, uh, on the, on the YouTube chat, just, uh, uh Caesar, um, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, just said that, uh, another interesting definition for, uh, he found, um, they found for, um, was it found sound was something that you come across whilst objects recorded intentionally would be classified as Foley? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, Foley art is a really cool uh, field. It's like this, yeah, this way of just like honing in on one sound. Like, I don't know. Yeah, that absolutely. Yeah, well, th yeah. Thanks a lot for that. That's a uh, yeah, I appreciate the contribution because yeah, it helps round out this like definition of found sound and the ways that sounds can be applied. Um, the work that Foley artists do are just unreal sometimes, like mm -hmm. the the different things that they come up with. Um, yeah, super cool. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I'm just gonna play the first couple of minutes of this uh, interview with an uh, a, an awesome composer soundscape artist who lives in BC named Hildegard Westerkamp, um, who has just done amazing work throughout, you know, since the 80s, uh, and has some very, um, <clears throat> some very refined thoughts on what it means to, uh, at least in the field recording domain, collect sounds uh, throughout the world. So I'll just play this for a couple of minutes. My music is usually very much about a place or a situation. So if I travel and make recordings, yes, very often I will uh, create pieces from that. Um, but it's not necessarily. It could be about a situation, um, about a political situation, an environmental situation as well. Sometimes I have a very clear idea and I go out recording for the composition. Um, in the early days, I used to just go out and record and then I would make a piece. Um, if I was excited by the recordings or by the um, situation that I had recorded. So it depends. Um, now that I've 
I have hundreds of recordings. Um, often I will not just record, I will go out specifically for a piece. Um, I take a very simple approach. I will have, uh, uh, in the early days I had analog recorders. Now I have a zoom recorder um, with just a normal zoom microphone. And um, I simply go out and move around in a way like a, uh, like a moving ear. The microphone is a moving ear. Um, so I will be recording something and if I hear something, the microphone will be directed towards what I hear. I may bring it very close to the sound. Say, say it's a river sound, water. Um, I might want to move very, very close into the specific water sounds, um, or I may want to get a further away perspective of the river. It depends a lot on, uh, uh, on what, I, what I would like to get for a specific composition, or what I'm hearing at the moment, and what attracts me. So, oh, uh, just a quick question as well. Um, was that, was, was the volume okay on that? Uh, it seemed fine for me, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, cool. So, yeah, that was a quick interview with Hildegard Vesterkamp with some insights on collecting sounds and what to look for with sounds. And um, in my own practice of working with found sound, I, I draw a lot from... Uh, the, you know, the works of Hildegard Vesterkamp and some of the meaning that's put into these pieces and the direction that they go. Um, there's a, there's a part of, there's a part of me that just loves this idea of breaking away from typical kind of metered music and saying, I'm not going to pay attention to things like tempo and I'm not going to pay attention to, um, you know, exact pitches, um, but more so I'm going to pay attention to the flow of the work and the intuitive design of how it's put together. And, you know, when I'm listening to it, does it feel like, does it feel like it flows correctly and it uh, has motion? Um, and yeah, I find listening to pieces by Hildegard is amazing for that kind of thing. So I highly recommend it. Um, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> So one of the things that I do a lot when I'm uh, collecting uh, field recordings or looking for sounds, you know, most of my practice is is done with a microphone in certain spaces uh, on adventures and walks. I find it a great excuse to get out into the world. Like I'll go for these, you know, three or four hour walks just to listen to things and to collect the interesting sounds of the world. So um, one of the things that I like to do a lot is to take pictures and videos and record visual um, connections to the spaces that I have with the sound so that later when I'm playing around with them, I can be reminded of the feeling that I had when I was there. So um, the a few of the pictures that were taken here are from an adventure that I took around St. John, New Brunswick uh, in this past summer in 2021. Um, and yeah, this first picture is, is at a place there uh, that's called Tin Can Beach um, on the south end of St. John. And one of these uh, awesome things about this space is that, you know, there's a gentle kind of like rippling of the tide. But in the background, you hear this like, you know, cacophony of industrial sounds, trains, cranes, garbage compactors, ship shipping containers, um, all, all these things. So you get this kind of beautiful clash of nature versus industry, which, you know, in itself has a has a, quite an intense dissonance when you listen to it, but but also can like, you know, allow someone to pull so much meaning out of a sound that is raw and collected from the world just like this. So um, when I look at pictures like these, when I'm composing, I'm reminded of this, uh, this feeling that I had when I was there. Um, <clears throat> this is on the west side of St. John on that same adventure. It was a little foggier earlier in the day. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I was just along this trail collecting sounds um, from the ocean, the seagulls and different things. It can be very peaceful. 
You know, one of the things that I consider about collecting found sound and composing with found sound is that sometimes it's not even as much about building a composition as it is about just having a lovely day, you know, and going out and soaking up the sun and just clearing your mind. It can just be a great thing um, to get outside, breathing fresh air. Um, another cool picture from the west side of St. John, this, this rock. Um, I recorded right behind this and took the picture at the same time. Um, there was something about this, uh, this scene that, I don't know, that's, it's like obviously very grounding looking, you know, this thick rock just in the middle next to the ocean. So kind of looks like a mountain at the same time as looking like you're just in front of it. So I thought that was very cool. Um, <clears throat> I also, when I'm exploring places, I look for kind of things that seem like they don't necessarily belong. Um, this, um, <clears throat> this I found in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, St. Andrews by the Sea. And it's this engine um, that's been sitting on the beach for years and years and years. I, I, you know, I've had people tell me that this thing was there, you know. 10 years ago like it's been there forever so when I when I look at it I can't help but think about the kind of experience that this object has gone through you know the cycle of the tides and the kind of constant erosion and the rust and all these things and you know in the way that it's impacted the environment around it as well and so one of the things that I did is that I took my little field recorder and stuck it inside one of these one of these holes here um, and recorded the outside world through the resonance of the holes. And I, and I found that, you know, from my experience, at least it, it packed so much into that recording where I was like, this is this ancient weird engine just sitting here on the beach forever. You know, how often do you get to hear what it's like inside of that engine? So I, um, you know, these are some of the things I love about these kinds of adventures. Um, so uh, I'm just going to quickly show an example of my own work. Uh, so I have to remind myself to go to Vimeo. Um, so I'm going to show you a piece of music that I made um, last summer uh, for this field school at this festival called Image Fest. Um, this um, <clears throat> this uh, piece was made. Uh, it was it was kind of prompted by a lot of you know um, I guess it's like a buildup of feelings related to being in um, in uh, in in curfew for five months um, here in Montreal and having gone through like this very intense long period of lockdown in the you know the winter and spring of 2021 and so this was created in may in a week for this field school and uh and it's called houseplant party um and uh, it was made in celebration of my houseplants uh for being one of the factors uh, that you know kept my mental health at a at, a, at an okay place throughout that period of time. Uh, and so this piece was composed uh, using a, a collection of field recordings and other kind of algorithmically generated uh, beats and tones. Um, and all of the samples that went into this piece were uh, filtered through a, um, a program that I wrote in Super Collider uh, with an Arduino soil moisture sensor that I stuck into my plant and I would process these sounds by um, watering my plant. Uh, and so it created kind of, I, I had a various, you know, various effects connected to it. So they would be like granular effects where it would chop the recording into grains and sort them based on the, you know, the amount of water or the, the way that the water was being poured into the plant and so all of this was kind of based in this concept of celebrating my house plants and uh and nourishing them as part of the process for creating a piece of music and also we created a music video with the plants too uh, and i think it's really cute so uh i'll just play this for you quickly Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> really beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, I'll just open it. Yeah, sorry about the the volume there. Um, I, I have a I have a um, a good pointer in my mind as to where it should be now. So hopefully there won't be any kind of dramatic changes in the volume. Um, so yeah, that uh, that piece uh, was yeah, debuted at this festival called Image Fest, um, and will be released at some undisclosed place at some undisclosed time. Uh, in the future. <laughs> Not all of my works uh, are kind of as beat based as that, but I, I thought it was a nice example to share um, for anyone who is interested in doing a more kind of like beat based work um, in some of the ways that sounds can, you know, expand and contract and create tension and resolution. Um, a lot of these like, you know, typical kind of uh, like or a lot of the you know techniques that someone would use as a songwriter can be translated into a more abstract way of composing and so um yeah they're very transferable skills um okay um, yeah there, oh sorry there's a, a question um sure. uh so so the about this someone's really curious about the soil sensor oh yeah, um, yeah. that 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 idea is really amazing um uh so you were using it to connected to an Arduino, so a little yeah. computer that 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 would uh, affect sounds or trigger sounds or yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. Here, give me one sec. Um, I'm going to get it. Uh, it was conveniently right next to me. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is like I, I did some like kind of intro Arduino stuff throughout last year. And so this is the little sensor here. Um, and I would stick this into the soil of the plant and then water close to it. And in the um, in the kind of Arduino uh, development software, um, you can define uh, kind of these bounds as to what the, you know, there's like a, a number between uh, I think you can just set it to whatever it is, but I think I had it set between like zero and a thousand. And so it would, uh, based on the amount of water in proximity to this thing, it would give you a number, uh, like a reading. Um, and that would be fed into this program that I wrote to, uh, you know, alter certain effects, like the wet dry of something mm -hmm. or the, uh, the amount that something would be granulated or it's feedback or, uh, or even like, filters or that kind of thing so yeah hopefully that answers the question okay yeah really really interesting <laughs> cool thanks uh yeah it was really fun i'm just gonna put this somewhere that doesn't break um okay uh it's yeah it's a fun process and like i i wanted to show that also because it's it's a um, it's an example of how you can really just work with any set of tools that you have access to to do stuff with sounds. You know, there's a lot of free stuff in the world that you can use to create music. And, um, you know, I did I did use Ableton to arrange the piece, but you don't have to. You could use literally anything like to do that. But uh, yeah, you can you can go in all sorts of directions. It's great. Um, yeah. Are there are there any other questions or? Um, he he. Uh, they have a follow up question. I, I he assumes that uh, it can be used to record the actual moisture data over a long time, and then play it back faster. Possibly. I mean, we could probably yeah. collect that information. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've thought about doing that as well. I just haven't uh, just haven't found the pathway yet. <laughs> um, I, get, I keep getting distracted. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um yeah it, it's totally something you could do and the sensor isn't that expensive i think this one was like you can get really good ones but this one i think was like 20 bucks um as an attachment so if you already have an arduino uno setup um which also in itself aren't super expensive for what they are um you can get a hold of this stuff quite easily um i recommend it for anyone Great. Um, cool so I guess this kind of nicely segues into um, the tools and sources 
component of this. Oh, and just a quick question too, so I know how quickly to go. Do, is the one hour cutoff time like super definite? Oh no, no, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Great. We go dark. I was getting a little nervous there for a second. 5 p.m. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're going all night long. <laughs> yes, this is the internet. we could. Yeah, yeah, this is the internet. We could go for a week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're not. We're not even close. <laughs> yes, we're just scratching the surface. <laughs> um. <clears throat> okay. Cool. So, yeah, I hope uh, these drawings are. Uh, they make sense. The. Uh, this one's the most ambiguous. It's supposed to be a vinyl record, um, but also kind of could be a solar system. Um, in which case, like the professor, Kevin Austin, that we were talking about, that would make a lot of sense. He uh, <clears throat> he once described to me in class, or he described to us in class, how uh, the only, or I forget how he phrased it, but it was like one of the oscillations in the world that hasn't finished its first uh, cycle or its phase cycle is um, the Big Bang. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and in that moment, everyone in class was like, oh, no. <laughs> Everything's a synthesizer. <laughs> it's awful. Um, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Everything is a synthesizer. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so tools and sources. Uh, so yeah, there's a field recorder, a little cassette tape, and a uh, a um, vinyl record or a solar system. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about like you know the accessibility to equipment that uh, you can have with this kind of thing. Like to get into this kind of world or this um, practice, you don't have to spend a lot of money in in fact like a lot of the best things that, that i come across are either free or very inexpensive um and um you know you can you can start collecting sounds in the world by using a phone uh, for instance like you know a, a lot of the times it can be easy to get hung up on like quality of recordings um but there there are so many ways around like you know, a phone, when you record on an iPhone in like M4A, it'll compress what you, the sounds that you've collected. So if you want to be collecting these like high definition, pristine sounds, like an iPhone won't work, but to collect sounds in general that have meaning and that you can use to create music with, you know, a, a phone recorder is just fine as long as you can keep it out of the wind. Um, or if you like the wind, then just record the wind. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there's... I, I would I would never discourage anyone from using their phone or some kind of like small device, a tape recorder, whatever, to collect sounds in the world because um, you know with that with the medium also comes a particular character that you don't get with other mediums, um, and so uh, your practice can really define your sound, um, and I just think you can own it uh, that way. So um, you know. Found sounds can be collected either through like field recorders, microphone recordings. You can dig into, you know, old cassettes and tapes and things. And, you know, if they're if they're public domain or if you change them enough, <laughs> uh, you can get away with using anything. Um, old vinyl records, you know, things that are scratchy, you know, like 50 cent fines at a record store um, that you can like put up to, you know, put on your turntable and either plug it in through USB or use a phone recording or whatever to collect these sounds. You can, you can, the world is uh, at your fingertips in terms of everything, you know? Um, I just look around the room and like, there's so many sounds here. <laughs> what am I gonna do? It could be awful. Um, but, um, you know, this is just a note that I wanted to encourage anyone who is thinking of getting into this to just like, if you want to start right away, um, take what you have and run with it. Cause it's always fun. Um, people, people are recommending, uh, uh, if you don't have Ableton uh, Reapers, uh, free to evaluate and then, uh, resamplomatic, resamplomatic, uh, let's is a plugin that lets you trigger any sound sample with MIDI oh, and cool. then 
someone else says super collider is free and open source and uh, yeah. someone recommends a zoom recorder for 90 usd nice of course zoom recorders man they're great <laughs> oh yeah zoom recorders are the best <laughs> yeah i yeah I, I have mine right here um this is what i use for like pretty much everything it's you know it's like the zoom h2n um it's got a lot of different options for like the polarity selections that you can use uh, and for the uh, kind of con mic configuration. Um, I don't know if you, <laughs> this is kind of funny what I'm doing here. But, uh, you know, you can you can record in like four channel surround sound with this. You can you can do like a mid side recording. Um, yeah. And, you know, this thing is not super expensive. It's like it's not extremely cheap but um but you know for for my purpose like it was it's awesome and eventually you know i'll upgrade to like the h5n or whatever um but you know right now my typical setup is i have this like little little thing that you can put on to block the wind if you're behind a, this isn't like it doesn't work super well but if you're behind a rock it works <laughs> uh, like if it's an extra windy day it's not great but yeah and then this little phone tripod and it's compact and you just put in a book bag and yeah so, well uh, um it's uh being by the ocean yeah the dealing with wind is is always <laughs> yeah um, always a factor yeah i'm gonna be i'm gonna be investing in a, in a new windscreen at some point soon uh that's a little more heavy duty but um <clears throat> but you know I've been able to get a lot of really awesome sounding recordings with this thing. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite a low investment. Um, so yeah, highly encourage, uh, jumping right in. Um, uh, so yeah, now, um, I'm gonna, this, I'm just gonna segue into this video. Uh, that's like an analysis of some music by the books. Um, because one of the things I really like about the books is that they, they collect their sounds in really in a, in a, in a very broad, interesting, um, collection of, uh, ways and techniques, you know, they use like little, they'll take, they'll put little slices into vinyl records and, um, and then have the vinyl records spin, uh, on, you know, on, across the slices to create a rhythm and then have that like amplified into a, like a PVC pipe that resonates at a certain frequency. And, um, and there, there you have like, you know, a kind of a tone to work with for a song. And it has this like very visceral kind of physical, real sound to it. Um, and you know, they just do beautiful things with techniques like that, you know, finding these strange ways to, configure sounds so um yeah I'll play this still the term the books takes on an entirely different meaning in and out of context truly nick zumudo is right when he says just by placing two disparate elements next to each other they immediately start a conversation as your brain tries to wrap itself around their relationship here's another associated sample one of my favorite songs by the books is Take Time off The Lemon of Pink. The song's essentially about taking time to enjoy life. You'll find that many of the book's songs are some universal message to humanity. Nevertheless, the song begins with this sample in Italian. Tutto è santo, tutto è santo, tutto è santo. Non c'è niente di naturale nella natura, ragazzo mio. Tentilo bene in mente. This comes from the 1969 film Medea by Pasolini, based on the famous play by Euripides. The beginning of this song easily shows how the books use samples in conversation with each other to convey ideas. So first, you hear in Italian that everything is sacred and there is nothing natural in nature. Then you hear cheers to that, telling you that this is a good idea. <laughs> And then you hear Nick sing, take time. Take time, take time, take time. To tell you the problem and solution that people do not realize that everything is sacred, that every moment is worthwhile, but if they take time, they will. This song is just an example, but all of these samples communicate with one another to build on an idea of humanity. 
which is something Paul believes to be at the heart of the book's music. What is relevant is that there is a universal humanity. The books truly are a band that samples in a unique way. The way they sample provides a useful way to view art, other people, and everything. I think we oftentimes allow things to be happening in the moment. Something is happening, and then it's not happening at all. We get an idea that is clearly inspired by a previous thought, and then consider it our own in the moment, rather than inspired by something else. When we look at a painting, our eyes shift from part to part, sometimes neglecting how all of them fit together and play off each other. To somebody that views the books in this way, the music is going to seem like these bubbles of sounds from many different sources. But if we connect those bubbles together, what we find is something more meaningful and beautiful. It is a lot more difficult to appreciate the fine details in a work of art while also seeing how those details Thought I'd stop it at Picasso because I'm not a huge Picasso fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the books though, amazing. Oh yeah, I, yeah. If uh, if there are people watching this that haven't listened to the books before, I just it's just a great adventure. Um, they... So lovely. I love the sample of the women laughing. It's so <laughs> it's so joyous and like complete, like <laughs> like. Uh, and I, I think they're laughing about like uh, there's another clip later on in that song and I think they're laughing about sex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're telling, yeah, anyway, but I, I, anyway, I just love that sample. Yeah, yeah, there's something in, you know, when you hear something like that in music and you can feel like you're kind of laughing, almost laughing with someone in a weird way, there's like, it's a pretty special moment. <laughs> you know, I. I, I love that kind of thing when it pops up and it gets you thinking too, you know, it's like, I'm a, I'm a big believer in having things just like come and switch up my mindset and just, you know, throw me around like in, in my brain, you know, just like scramble things up a bit. And, you know, when you're listening to a piece of music and all of a sudden there's like three people laughing hysterically, I think that's a, that's a moment where you can scramble. <laughs> yeah. Um, Scrambling may not be every, for everybody, and that's fine. Um, but if you need a good scramble, the books will help you with that. <laughs> every album, too. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, oh, yeah, and from this um, kind of, you know, I was talking a bit about hardware. Now I'm going to talk a bit about just some free software options that are out there. Now, some people did mention Reaper and uh, Super Collider which are all open source. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate that they're awesome resources. I love Reaper, um, for, you know, for what it is. And I used it for quite a bit of time. Um, yeah, there are also things, uh, like, um, uh, PD pure data. If you're into like, if, I don't know if you've ever thought of getting into like max, like what was, what was max MSP, um, pure data is like, you know, a branch from the same developers of Max, uh, the person who originally was on the kind of partnership for Max, but then started developing PD as like the open source, um, as an open source version that people can use because, yeah, it's just great and people should have access to it. You know, you shouldn't have to pay like $300 to code something <laughs> to program sound. So yeah, PD is a really cool thing to look into if you want to get into algorithmic music. Um, again, I also highly recommend Tidal Cycles. Uh, it's, a, it's an awesome software, or not software, it's an awesome language. It's kind of like built on top of this language called Haskell in which you can create these, uh, you can program um, beats and um, patterns of sound. And it's uh, it's kind of, it works in the same way the sampler would work, but uh, you can create extremely complex patterns um, that are based off just a few lines of code. Uh, and so if anyone is into, you know, finding a rabbit hole of musical coding that is actually quite simple, um, uh, I recommend Tidal Cycles. <clears throat> um, so yeah, one, again, uh, probably a lot of people have used this, but um, for for doing stuff with found sound and uh, and uh, field recordings and stuff, I find having a, an audio editor program to be such an essential thing. Um, I used Audacity for a long time for the purposes of just opening up a file, like a sound file, and just clipping the edges, having fade-ins and fade-outs, 
uh, and normalizing it, taking away noise, whatever. You know, I wouldn't use Audacity. You can. You can use Audacity to compose. Uh, but I would mostly use it for just refining the sounds that I've collected, making sure they're all at a, like a consistent level. Um, so, and it's free. Uh, it's awesome. I use, I used it for like a decade, uh, from in high school to like my mid twenties. And I love it. It's just great. Another program that I'm going to recommend, uh, highly recommend is this free program called Cecilia. Um, and it's just like a, you know, a sound processing software. It looks like a lot to get into, but it's actually, once you get the, once you get an idea of the general um, layout of it, it's actually, it exponentially expands into a world of possibilities. And, you know, <clears throat> again, it's not, a, it's not a software for composing per se. Um, although once again, you can, you know, <laughs> uh, but I, I mostly use it for applying like effects to sounds, creating interest, um, you know, gr granular type of things, or just, yeah, processing sounds into, um, new experiences and changed moments. Um, so, and, and at the end with all these things, I'm gonna include like a list of links, which I think will be in the chat uh, or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, another we'll, one- We'll definitely add them to the video description at the end afterwards. Great, okay, thanks. Um, a really cool thing that, you know, probably some people know about, I just wanted to, I just wanted to share it cause I use it a lot uh, is, is this, uh, is this reverb plugin called Valhalla Supermassive. Um, it's kind of a funny name, but uh, I think it, you know, it makes references to uh, a lot of space jargon, things like black holes and um, those kinds of things, which well, if you're dealing with reverb that sounds like a black hole, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I find that this, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting to use beyond like your kind of typical um, inbuilt reverb and something like Ableton or whatever, but, um, yeah, uh, I recommend it for sure. It's very fun. Um, and, oh yeah. <laughs> and now we compose. Uh, so <laughs> I just wanted to do a, uh, you know, we're already at an hour and I didn't expect this to go, but again, like it's so easy to fall into a thought, a den of thought worms. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, I should have known. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just going to take, you know, 15, 20 minutes and uh, just run through like how I would begin composing a piece of music with found sound. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to open up Cecilia. Are there any questions before we jump in, though? Um, no, uh, some comments about how awesome Audacity is. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, um, and um, someone recommended uh, tuberculosis fish recommended Paul stretch. Paul stretch uh, is a awesome. great plugin. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, the only reason I didn't include Paul stretch was because I uh, I was having trouble re-downloading it on this computer, and I, I don't know what it was or what the issue was. But I was thinking like if I can't figure it out right now, it's kind of not fair. To... My first, yeah, I mean, any I uh, like most. Uh, people's first exposure to the Paul stretch was like maybe a Justin Bieber song stretched out 800 <laughs> times or something. Yeah. So it turns into this kind of like epic kind of ambient soundscape, but it's very useful for other things. Oh, Paul stretch is the best. Um, yeah, it's such a powerful software that you can just use to stretch anything. Like every sound turns into an elastic band. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, or like spaghettification in a black hole. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Audacity is really cool too. Um, I Like I can't say enough about it. You know, there was a period of my life when I was younger that I was like, I want something better than Audacity. And then now like, no, where did, the, where did those days go? Where Audacity was like the thing that I always used. I should have just stayed. Yeah. I'm on the uh, Amadeus kick. <clears throat> yeah, I meant to mention that Amadeus is the is my favorite thing. Like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. If um, if anyone is interested in kind of it, yeah, it's it's pretty inexpensive, like fifty bucks. Um, I think. Yeah, 
yeah you can email for a student discount too if you're if you're a student mm -hmm. yeah it's made by this mathematician in the uk um i think it's the uk um and uh and it's just like audacity but um but just amped up on a bunch of different levels like you know they like the dsp in it is really solid um uh, you know when you make cuts it like cuts at a zero crossing so there's no like crazy clip sound in it um at least sometimes maybe there's yeah at least in all my experiences with it it just like cuts super cleanly um and uh the tools in it are nice it's a great editor yeah um uh, so yeah. i i just have to bring this up uh, the uh chris obray on facebook said he stretched out the icq uh oh sound uh, out with Paul Stretch, and it's very creepy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I can imagine that being super creepy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know how long it was stretched for. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, whenever that comes up, I'll just interrupt me. I'm, I'm gonna open up Cecilia now just to give a quick uh, intro to that. Um, okay. Oh, hold on. Let me make sure I press the button. Okay, good. So, um, this is Cecilia again, completely free, awesome software for doing things like time stretching and, and all of that, but it's basically a piece of software where you, you know, you play with your sounds and turn them into different sounds. Um, and, uh, I find it really exciting to, you know, if there's parts of a sound that I really like that I want to, uh, you know, amplify or play around with, or if there's like a certain kind of characteristics to a sound, like it's a good first starting point for generating interesting material. Um, so, uh, the way to begin is that if you go into, uh, file i don't can you see file on here when i'm going into the taskbar or not taskbar right? yes okay cool um so the way that you would start using this program is you select from a collection of modules that are pre-built into this and so you have different things like you can play with the dynamics like degrade distortion feedback loop or all those things super cool there's filters a whole set of different kinds of filters that are modulated and um you know some of them are pretty kind of like standard filters that we you would use for things but um some of them are very experimental exciting things um you have a bunch of multi-band stuff some pitch type things um yeah random accumulator is really cool just like accumulates on certain uh like frequency ranges um some reverbs, resonant reverbs, uh, some spectral stuff, so stuff to play with certain kind of frequency type things. Um, yeah, some things to take your sounds and synth synthesize them. Uh, so you get these very like complex synthesized waveforms um, that are really cool. My favorite <clears throat> in all things is, uh, now this is one thing I say about, you know, my degree in electroacoustic studies is that I'm not actually in a music program. I'm in a time program. Um, <laughs> I'm studying, I'm studying just not even science of time in any way, but more so just, just my own tripped out understanding of how stressful time or exciting time can be. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it just throws you down a hill and you just snowball into this. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I yeah, time is my favorite module in this uh, in this program. So a lot of the times, um, you know, there's a lot of like grain granular things. And if people don't know what granular synthesis is, it's literally um, these processes for taking like a sound file and chopping it up or just dis distributing it, distributing it in these like, um, you know, these little sound grains that will play for you and uh, and you can control the way that happens the pitches of the grains and the amount that they are you know recycled and the amount there were the the envelopes that they arrive in and um so i guess i'll just uh i think i already have this one open but i'll just play with pelletizer um <clears throat> and i will uh set up 
my sound source is Zoom audio. That's good. So, um, so you have a couple of things to pay attention to here. So these lines that are on this um, program are uh, your automation lines. So you can select different um, different uh, parameters that you want to change, and you can set up using this little pencil tool or whatever these like automation changes that uh you know that will alter these these little timelines and ways and you can turn them on and off and um it's it's a very powerful tool and i'm only going to just go over the basics uh, so the way that you would load in a file here is this input section you would click here um and then it allows you to uh access these uh you know your filing system, um, and uh, I'm I'm just gonna randomly choose a sound that I had in here. I think uh, I had one that was uh, kind of funny. Uh, uh, oh yeah, Ooh, it's kind of loud. Um, but did it did it come out? Did you yes. hear? Yes, I think it's, I think it'll be fine for sure. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'll load in this. It, it's got like a loon in it. I recorded this at this place called Lake George, New Brunswick um, last summer. And I managed to catch some pop song playing in the background. These people talking a loon sound and the sound of water all in one thing. And it was a great 15 seconds. Um, and, uh, and so basically I've set this up to, I'll just explain it as it goes. So I'm just gonna press play. So right now, <clears throat> um, I should probably play what the original sound is. It's kind of hard to play the original sound in this, I guess, unless I set it up like here. And, uh, have it just stretch like this. You can get a sense of what the original sound would be. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. I had the position on random, so it was still coming out all wacky. But, but um, so basically what I'm just going to do is I really like the loon sound that's in here. So uh, I'm going to turn off the grain duration and the random pitch, and I'm going to turn on grain position. Uh, and I think... I want to find the place where I can access this uh, this loon sound. Um, so, because then if I access that loon sound, you know, you make whatever choice you want. This is the freedom of playing with found sounds. But what I was just drawn to is this kind of like tonal element of the loom loon. It's kind of funny that I say loom. <laughs> yes. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so. So on uh, on your screen, can you describe what the lines are like? What yeah. what you're changing there? Yeah. So these lines are connected to these different parameters that are down here. So you would have a line that is like the transposition of the sound, so the pitch of the sound. So if I were to put this sound at the very bottom, and then this at the very top, you would hear that as this raises, the pitch of the sound would also raise too. So by turning this on, so. <laughs> Sounds pretty freaking cool, I think. Um, uh, but I don't know, yeah, I'll just, I'll just do something and then, um, this is one of those programs where it's kind of hard to get the result that like, you can't decide what you want. You kind of just have to go with it. <laughs> um, and so I think I'll just find a thing here. So it, it changes all these parameters simultaneously? Yeah. <clears throat> That's awesome. Yeah. For them to be changed, though, you have to turn them on uh, with these uh, little play buttons down here. And if they're off, then it just uh, will it'll allow you to change them manually while it's playing. Um, so. You know, if I play this, I can change the 
For some reason it's not playing anything right now. Hold on. Um, uh, that's that's probably why. Uh, Cesar said uh, earlier that 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 sound with the time shift uh, sounded like a spaceship taking off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with loons. Yeah, I don't know why this isn't playing right now. Uh, hold on. There's something here that. There's some like positioning thing. Just gotta move it around a bit until I find. <laughs> Chris so bright says, I had hadn't heard of uh, Cecilia before today, and I could say for sure I'll soon be messing around with it until I'm slouch forward drooling at 4 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, here I'll just open up a different module and then I think we'll be able to just uh there we go. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of funny. I'll, I'll go with this one. So um, just for the purpose of like workshop, you know, I, I really like I, I want to not get rabbit holed right now because it's not it's not OK for it's not appropriate because people are watching. <laughs> um, I don't want to waste time. But uh, uh, so you can. So what you would do if you want to like output one of these sounds um, is uh, you would go into this output section uh select this box and then you can name your file um and usually you know as as a as a convention i date something when i make it so it'd be like 2022 0206 and then um lake grain grain parade uh, and then you can press save, and then this will ju this just sets the destination. It doesn't save once you once you go to this uh, once you want to finish what you're doing. You go to this action tab up here, and then you press bounce to bit bounce to disk uh, or command B, and then you press that, and then it just bounces, and you can go to your file um, and that you saved it in, and it will be there. So that's uh, this is uh, Cecilia. Um, at its core. Uh, so now I'll move on to Ableton for the next uh, part of this. So um, <clears throat> Ableton. Oh yeah, it's minimized. Um, yeah, Cecilia is so much fun. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, really, it's really dangerous though. Uh, <laughs> you could just get stuck in there. Yeah, you thought you guys thought Audacity was bad for yeah. <laughs> getting deep deep into it. Yeah, and just basically feet. use Audacity and then Cecilia at the same like you know process. <laughs> like you'll never leave. It's awful, but also great. Yes, I say it's awful because it's funny to say, but <laughs> um, but we're lucky to have such awesome free software in the world uh and so oh right okay let's log back on brain um we're in ableton now and i want to go get that sound that we just recorded um process sounds we have the lake george grain parade or lake grain parade so i'll load that into here on just some arbitrary track um and i have one that i did earlier too which is this uh one that i call loons people lake um, I thought that was pretty fun. Typically what I would do is after I finish with Cecilia, I would go into my audio editing program like Amadeus or Audacity, and I would, um, <clears throat> I would put fade ins and fade outs on the edges um, of the track, and I would normalize the track uh, to bring it up to um, zero decibel level um, because it just helps with consistency. It gives you more control when, you know, right right now this file that that I output here, Lake Grain Parade, uh, has a very different level of amplitude than this Loons People Lake thing. So, um, you know, it's just, it's not, you know, it's not like a rule. There are no rules, but, um, but it's, it helps me, I guess. Uh, otherwise, you know, I have to go in here and say, oh, I guess, I guess this is what, what is right. 
Um, so basically the first steps that I would do, I've held in a few samples in here earlier uh, that I've collected over time that I thought were pretty neat. I got a couple from the iPhone and I got a couple from, uh, from my Zoom field recorder and a couple from Cecilia. And so <clears throat> this is how, like when I'm composing a track, um, my process is I just select things and I just throw them into the DAW. And I, uh, because like, you know, I, I can't have an organized like set of things that I'm going to do. I have to just throw paint at the wall and see, see the face that's there and say, oh, that's my friend, the new face. Um, and so uh, I'd like to just start by sharing a couple of these sounds. So we've got this, uh, what is this? What is this one called? Oh, Laundromat at Saint Zotique. Um, <laughs> let me know if this is too loud to... Uh... <clears throat> so I thought that was pretty cool. I was at the laundromat last week and I heard like a broken laundry machine that was making this horrible sound. And I, and you know, because of my excitement for collecting sounds, I said, oh, there's an opportunity there. I can save this moment. You know, this moment in time has become precious. And now this is an experience that I can remember forever listening to this horrible sound. Um, so <laughs> so I, uh, I collected it on my phone. And, <clears throat> and then just, you know, now I've thought like, oh, wouldn't that sound cool with some kind of like drive or distortion or something like that? Um, or wouldn't it sound cool if I just pulled in Valhalla Supermassive, this, uh, this um, you know, black hole style um, reverb plugin that also has a bunch of cool echoes, some modulation type stuff like chorus, ambience, flanging. Um, but just for like the big effect, uh, I'm just going to go with the Final Frontier Massive Reverb. Uh, I think that'd be a funny thing to show. What does this crazy laundromat sound like with a huge Final Frontier Reverb? So that's going to like play out for like 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> this thing that Ableton does when you like pause the thing. Oh, I can turn it up a tad. OK, cool. Uh, <clears throat> I'll put it up to six decibels. We'll see how that sounds. Um, maybe I'll turn up the sample as well. Uh, so you know, one of the things that I hear when I hear this, uh, this sound is you know, if I was in an ambient music mood, I would say I would duplicate this sound and then I would unwarp it. And I would go in and do something like transpose the sound up five steps, like what could be a third. Um, and I would see what it sounds like in some kind of, uh, with you know, explore the possibilities of harmonicity between um, these crazy laundromat sounds that you didn't expect would be kind of ambient orchestra. <laughs> going to play out forever so I'll solo the next track because <laughs> that's this maybe I can uh because I find it annoying that it plays out forever I can go in and I can do some modulation of the wet dry uh of this reverb and I can say maybe once this gets to the end I want to reveal some of the character of this sound I don't want it to be this like you know black hole apocalypse strings kind of situation, but I'd rather it also have some kind of like visceral character. Um, and same with this one. I'd like this one to also explore its own character a little bit, some self-exploration in the laundromat. Um, so yeah, I'd modulate some of these and see how that sounds.
Oh, they're also just both muted right now. The whole point of doing this was so that it would stop when I wanted to talk again. <laughs> I forgot about that. So yeah. Nice. It's a cute little tail. Um, and then, yeah, I have this uh, thing that I recorded at Concordia here. I thought it was kind of neat because it, it's like a little drone. Um, so I kind of want to, you know, just in this, you know, 15 minute piece of music that I'm making here, I want to transition from uh, this like, you know, introductory um, laundromat dramaturgy to a, uh, to this kind of, so I, I got this recording of um, the windshield wipers of my mom's car uh, during Hurricane Elsa in uh, last summer in uh, St. John, New Brunswick. And I thought it was pretty cool. I was like, there's a lot wrapped up in there. There's a hurricane that came through. It's like rain that came, traveled however many kilometers to get here. Now it just happens to be dropping on my mom's car. Um, and I'm just here recording it. So I thought that was kind of cool. And it, it it contains like some pretty like virtuous elements, like a, like a rhythmic element like this. It almost sounds like a bass drum as you'll hear. So. Um, and in this kind of sound, I hear a lot of opportunity, uh, especially as we move forward. The rain starts to pick up a bit. While I was waiting for my mom, I got a little, I got, I, I, it, it, I turned on the blinker because I thought it would sound cool. It awarded me some time to be experimental. <laughs> Everybody in the parking lot is like, what? What is happening? <laughs> What's this person? Is he okay? <laughs> Why does he have a microphone set up in the car? What's wrong? <laughs> yeah, why has he turned the blinker off? Just on and off. What's what's wrong with this person? Um, <clears throat> in a track like this, I see a lot of opportunity, or I hear a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, there's this element that you could, you know, I like, one of the things that I like to think about when I'm composing is the vertical aspect of a sound. And by vertical, I mean the um, <clears throat> the like spectrum of frequencies that you can play with and you know the the different ways that um, <clears throat> elements kind of uh, make themselves known um, and I like to take tracks and I like to isolate certain parts of it uh, so like in this you know there's an opportunity here um, I don't like how slow it is so I'm gonna speed it up a little bit um, just for fun just see how it sounds and then uh, <clears throat> um, so it's pretty cool. It's a little more energetic, a little more tension. Um, and then I'd like to also transpose it back down. You get this kind of like cool kick style bass type thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not wearing headphones right now, so it's not the most accurate, but like what I might do is like apply a cutoff filter to this and isolate um, just like the lower frequency range so that it's a little bit easier to work with. You can control it a little bit better. It almost has this like heart beating effect. And then eventually later you can open that up a bit. I might take this and modulate the frequency to open up near the end, near this like climax of the piece um, eventually. Just for fun. So, you know, to come back to what we have. Um, 
Let's move this over here. And this is what we have so far. I'll, I, I won't start at the very beginning of the laundromat dramaturgy. <laughs> uh, but I'll... I'll... So I don't know, I find working with these types of tones, um, you're kind of in this, uh, you know, you can also feel as though you're working in ceramics a little bit. Like you're taking these like bits of things and mashing them together and then just like digging pieces out and uh, exploring form. Um, and so, you know, I've made three copies of this, like of this windshield wiper thing. And so now I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm given a lot of opportunities to include some, some rhythmic variation in this so i could put in one of these windshield wipers here and just see how it sounds when i just throw them together kind of has this like i don't really like having the blinker in there i find it kind of distracting so maybe i'll just So that kind of like starts to, uh, I don't know, just, just like draw out some character in the rhythm. You're getting this thing that's not so like connected like to any kind of like super structured temporal organization, but you, uh, you can still define a kind of connected rhythm to what's happening because there is a kind of uh, a general type of structure that um, presents itself and repeats and so you know you you hear that as an associated pattern and I, I like the way that that sounds and so if you want to include a little bit more tension you might just uh, take this drone and inc include some some higher octave type of things so you might put it up an octave and so this would kind of come in here and is this rhythm kind of opens up you also get this uh... <clears throat> yeah amazing that's the the thumping sound chris uh O'Bray says that um the neighbors upstairs are horses and they have thick carpets is what i call that symbol <laughs> <laughs> yeah horse neighbors that's a cool horse. track that's a cool track name uh, <laughs> i think that's what we should call it <laughs> it's a good band name too yeah um i'll just do like a couple more things really quick i don't want to take up too much more time i want i really want to include this like lake thing here um so kind of, kind of, kind of has like another like relatable kind of rhythmic feature to it. It's like granularly bumping around this like sound soundscape of this 15 second Lake George recording. I want it to be a little bit faster because it's easier to connect things together. Uh, you know, slow, slow changing rhythms that aren't, <clears throat> that aren't kind of Temporarily, temporarily structured are more difficult to associate as being connected as when something is much faster than the rhythm that's already there. So if it's faster, you might associate it more with being connected to the rhythm of the uh, of the um, wipers. So we'll see what this sounds like if we just load it in right here when we get this, when we bring in this like higher octave drone. Yeah, then maybe 
as a last thing, I don't know, you know, this is all very quick. It takes time with these things. Like, well, it takes more than like 30 minutes to kind takes of time. <laughs> takes, takes time. Takes <laughs> time. <laughs> takes. <laughs> that, yeah, that was, that was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> that's um, a, that's what the books call back, by the way. Everybody. Yeah. It shows how big books fans we are. <laughs> um i really like the sound of the rain here i think it's like a cool texture um and uh, and i'd like to isolate part of that sound so i might do something like bring in a high pass filter um <clears throat> and a way that you can increase include like increase like some of the tension if you want to like build tension and uh have something that allows the listener in something as abstract as this you need to work with things like tension uh in you know very significant ways and understand that things that have higher frequency ranges have like higher energy like that you know draws your ear in more the things that get closer to the the frequency range of like three to five k are the things that are the most resonant in your ear and so they draw you in the most um and you don't want to overuse those things but um when you have an opportunity to use it to build tension um it can really add a lot of like interesting elements to the piece that you're making uh, this, uh i've got this like high high frequency like raindrop material here and so I see an opportunity to pull in a like high pass filter um, to isolate those sounds away from the kind of windshield wiper sound um, uh, and create a nice like dense texture, um, which I can increase in volume, maybe add a compressor to it um, and uh, you know, just a little bit. I'm not gonna make it too crazy. Put it in here. Um, okay, last thing I'll show, super cool tip, is if you have something like this and you want to in, you want to increase that tension even more and you want to add some density to that high, like high frequency texture sound. Uh, what you can do is, um, I'll just, uh, just gonna do command J wait, command J oh, hold on. Uh, consolidate. Yeah, that should be command. That's what I pressed. Okay. Um, but anyway, if you want to go in here, you can make a, a direct copy of that sound and then I'm going to make two of them. And then I'm gonna pan them left and right, just like this. And then I'm gonna go into the sound and on whatever DAW you have, uh, detune it by like a couple cents uh, and change them on each side. Do the one like two cents and do the other like three cents. Make sure that they're not warping. Um, and then through time, they'll, they'll uh, be changing their phase relationship with each other. And so that creates the sense of like changing space or like expanding spatialization of the sound. And you gotta kind of tweak it a little bit, but you'll you'll hear it if I play it here. So I'll just isolate these ones. So play these ones here. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so let's just, uh, as, as a, like a final thing. Oh, one, uh, one question from Mikey Hogan. Uh, yeah. He says, yes, um, do you do much sound editing around removing noise from your recordings? Um, he says that uh, a lot of his recordings have a noise floor that he wants to remove. And he's yeah. wondering whether or not to embrace that or not. There's some pretty cool tools that you can use for that if you want to get into it that, uh, um, I'm not going to open it because like recently it's been making my, uh, my Ableton crash. I don't know what's going on. Maybe I just need to upgrade my, maybe they're forcing me to upgrade. Um, but, uh, this like, uh, where is it? There's this RX seven 
uh, voice denoise I've used quite a bit if I want to take noise out of uh, some of my recordings. Um, I don't I don't get into it too much because I kind of like noise. I like to play around with it. If I if I want to remove noise, I typically will just like um, filter it out uh, pretty abruptly. Um, yeah, it's just because that's my it's my um, it's my preference, I guess. Like, but yeah, I've I've noticed that this thing works okay. It's not perfect. Um, you know, it's not a su super, super high quality denoiser, but it does a job <laughs> at least like it has an effect. So, um, yeah, if you were going to get something, uh, I'd recommend taking a look at this if you haven't already. Um, if you, he also, he says, um, uh, honestly, a lot of the filtering, uh, uh, stuff that you're doing is, is answering his question too. So, like, okay. Uh, but isolating the sounds and parts of the sounds and stuff. Okay, I'm glad. Yeah, I like to think about um, sounds and spectrum and these things as like a forest, you know, like when I'm picturing like my sounds connected to each other, it's like the bass sounds are like the roots and the high frequency sounds are the branches. And if I want to see a little sunlight, sometimes I just go chop off those branches, <laughs> which uh, I don't know, that's not necessarily always the best thing to do with trees. <laughs> I just <laughs> chop them down. I want to see the more of the sky? Yeah, I'm super morbid. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'll just play this thing that we have here. This like two minute super rough like soundtrack uh, or sound found soundtrack. Um, this is in the style that I typically do. This stuff is more like a soundscape style, like electric electroacoustic processing away from like tempo or anything kind of like strictly temporal. Um, I encourage it if you if you don't get down with uh, you know typical kind of songwriting within like structured tempo um, because it can be really fun and freeing and you can just throw things around and sculpt out some kind of cool uh, sound squash. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll just play this right now. Oh, I could have started it far back. Not too bad. I'd say that's like kind of like a. It has promise as a as the start of a movement. Maybe maybe this will be one of my RPM tracks. <laughs> you made it in February too. That's oh, awesome. No. Oh, that's great. I like it. Yay! Thanks. Cool. Thumbs up. <laughs> I saved it. Um, cool. Yeah, that's pretty much the end. I have. I had one more slide that has like the Jeremy Dutcher video that I thought was really cool, but I don't know like how much time do y'all have? Is this like getting way over time in the stress? I'm people have been invested the entire time, so I think I uh, think they'd they'd want to see it. Okay, cool. I yeah. thought it, I, I I'm just like 
Yeah, I'm really driven to show that video because it's just like oh, yeah. just such a beautiful album that Jeremy Dutcher made. And it's using, it's like kind of motivated by the uh, um, collections of these like um, wax cylinder recordings of people singing in his language um, from, you know, archives and stuff. And I thought it was quite relevant, but it also very much transcends anything that we've talked about here. It's just, the album is just amazing. Um, so yeah, I'll just share that. It's like a five minute CBC quick doc thing. Um, uh, cool. But are, are there any other like questions or comments that people have before we jump into that? Uh, no, uh, no. Cool. They have people applauding and saying super cool track. Oh, yay. <laughs> that's, that's nice. That, that gives me the old, the old heart warmth. <laughs> it's good to have feedback yeah it's very it's very nice i had so many butterflies before this came on and so now the butterflies have landed and they're all just sitting on a little branch um okay <clears throat> here we go when i came into a better understanding of my language Wolustigwe. I started to understand my place in the world a little bit better and started to relate to the world around me differently. And so that's why it was important for me to, to do this album in my language because there's less than 100 fluent speakers left. It's important to, for people to understand a true history and what has actually happened and what continues to happen in this country um, around the systematic devaluing of indigenous languages and culture. As soon as I came to understand a little more about my mother's journey with the language, she went into the day schools um, at a very young age, when she was six years old, and you weren't allowed to speak your language there. In fact, you were, you were physically punished, you were beaten if you did. You know, coming to understand that it wasn't safe for her to speak her language when she was young. And her mother, um, my grandmother, said, you know, it's better if you don't know the language, and so we're just not gonna speak it to you. Intergenerational effects of that shame around language and culture um, are clear, and so that's, why I turned to the archive. When I first got to hear these voices, um, that word for me was a profoundly transformational moment in my life. And it connected me all the way up and down to those who have gone before and those who have yet to come. At first, I would, I would listen over and over again. I would start to sketch where the melody was going. And then finally, after that, I could, I could put some notes to it. I sort of took those notes with me and, and went home and started to sit at my piano. And to create arrangements and worlds around each of these melodies and let those melodies guide my process. I was very, very fortunate, you know, to have a music education and to be able to, you know, to transcribe what I was hearing. It was a process of deep listening, of really trying to sit there with these headphones and hear what these voices had to tell me. Getting to witness the life in these recordings, getting to hear my ancestors laugh, tell stories, sing songs, you know, dance, you can hear them dancing. This is incredible to me. You know, this was collected in the early 1900s and it's been living in the museum ever since. You know, as a young person, I didn't know about this collection and these songs and so for me, I felt such a responsibility to go and share that with other young people. 
So when you look at the album cover, you can see wax cylinders on the floor, which were uh, what these were collected on using the phonograph machine in the middle there. Uh, and I'm seated in the chair with this uh, traditional jacket on. I wanted to represent that time that these songs were collected. And so that was sort of where, where this whole album kind of came from, was that impetus to say, I've witnessed this beautiful thing, these old voices, and it's not doing any good sitting on a shelf collecting dust. This project allowed me to do was like sit down with my mother and my elders in my community and, and ask them about their lives and say, what was your experience of music growing up? What did, what did your community sound like? you know, growing up. For me, starting, you know, this record, it's called, uh, with a death chant, Mejanud, was a very clear statement to me that even though a lot of narratives get applied to our languages, especially Wolistuwe, you know, because there's so few speakers left, a lot of people say, oh, it's a dying language, you know? Um, I don't believe that to be true. Nothing ever died. You know, our dances and our songs and our language, they just had to go away for a bit for safekeeping. And our elders tell us that it's time. It's time to take it all out and it all needs to come out. And it won't be until then that we're going to be able to come to understand each other. Tahu. Really beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it almost brings me to tears. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a, and the, the, the record is just, unreal like mm -hmm. i listened to it so many times like i i recommend it to just anybody anybody who could possibly listen to it. let's throw it into everybody's ears <laughs> it's great the power of recorded sound mm -hmm. absolutely um so um, yeah oh sorry one uh, uh i have i have one thing <laughs> yeah. that uh um remember the the paul stretched icq uh oh drone yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I can play that for people right now oh gosh, if you want to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Here we go. All right, y'all ready? Here we go. I can't hear it. Oh, you can't hear it? Okay. Uh, I think I, think, I got uh, it. I, yeah, my settings. Oh, uh, hang on. Sorry about that. It's, it's worth it. It's worth it. There we go. I've got it. Beautiful. <laughs> Utterly horrifying and amazing. Like, <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the beginning of the theme song to Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, like, uh, you, you, say, uh, you had one more thing to, to say, did you? Uh, no, I was just going to say that, that, that I'm done. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Charles, this has been amazing. Uh, like I, I love, I love thinking about this, and you're uh, an excellent guide through this, through this world. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's been a huge pleasure. Um, super humbled to hang out here and just, uh, yeah, talk about sounds. It's just a, uh, it's, it's great. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and for everybody out there. Uh, Take part in the RPM challenge. Uh, if you don't know, it's a recording challenge to anybody to make music or sound, any sound, in the uh, month of February. Um, so check it out, rpmchallenge.com. And uh, thank you to Lanya Vani for co-presenting -pres this uh, this workshop today. Um, thanks, Sarah, for being a part of it. 
Yeah, of course. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Elling. That was really awesome. And uh, everybody in the chat, see you next time. We'll paste all the links that uh, Charles mentioned uh, as a in the comment or the description of the video. And um, yeah, until next time. <laughs>